about the tithe. I'm going to put this in my mouth first, if you don't mind me uh, absorbing a halls while I'm talking just for throat's sake. But I'm going to talk about tithe, and I want to begin by saying this, why tithe? Why tithe? Why do we tithe? I come into this knowing this. No doubt there are people, and this is the 4th of July week, uh, week, so I'm hoping that people, those that aren't present with us today, will come back and listen to this again, or for the first time if they're absent today. But I can tell you this. I know that when we think of tithe, there are people that are under the sound of my voice this morning, whether again in this room or online or however you might be hearing me. I know that there are people who might be thinking one of two things, or likely are thinking one of two things. One, oh no, I'm back at church and the preacher's talking about money. Exactly what I thought was going to happen at some time or another. Some might be along those lines. Others will be under the sound of my voice and they'll be saying, teach me. They have a heart and a passion. Teach me so that I can know. I believe this no matter which line, which side of that line people fall on, those who are, oh, here we go again, or those who are teach me, of the teach me spirit. No matter which side of the line they are on, I believe this to be true of both, that both of them would find themselves saying this, if I were to ask the question, they would respond with a yes. And if the question were this, do you really believe that God wants to raise you up and not set you down? Do you believe that God wants you to prosper in being well-being? Do you believe that? I believe no matter which side of the line one finds themselves on, they would say, I believe that to be true. I believe that God wants to bless. I believe that God wants to raise up. I believe that God wants to heal. Healing comes in many ways. Healing comes not only in in the miracle of someone's leg growing out or hand being healed or cancer being cured or blind eyes seeing or dead raising up healing also comes to the mind to a mind that believed a lie for so long that that lie had become a truth even though it has all along been a lie healing comes in revelation by holy spirit that awakens us and causes us again to hunger and thirst after things we had long set aside because we had seen all the different ways it had been misused misgoverned misaligned and because of those things people position themselves people today that take upon themselves the opinion I don't go to church because all the preacher ever does is talk about money those people most of them have seen excesses they've seen indulgences they've seen preachers go to jail or leaders not just preachers but people go to jail because they've received the tithe and money people have trusted them they've given their tithe they've given their offerings they've done all of this only to see the person that's leading that ministry, he or she or whoever they might be, only to see them squander it, use it for self-purpose, grow themselves, not grow the ministry. They've seen so many things, so immediately there begins to build up in us that because there's a piece of Adam that's still in us that always has this sense, I'll show them. And what I'll do is I'm going to stop bringing my first and my best. I'm going to stop tithing. I'm going to stop bringing my offering. I'm going to stop having faith. I'm going to stop demonstrating that I trust God. And I'll show them. I'm going to make sure they don't buy another car. I'm going to make sure they don't buy another house. I'm going to make sure they don't whatever it is that they might be doing. I'll make sure they don't do that because I'm going to withhold my tithe and offering. And we take upon ourselves the ability to do exactly what Adam and Eve did. And that was, you know what? I'm not going to trust God to show me what I need to see. I'm going to, become, I'm going to try to put myself in the position of God. If I will go ahead and eat of the fruit, then I will see everything that's been hidden from me. I will be like God. And people take upon them the position when I see error in the church or I see indulgences in the church or I see uh, whatever, excesses in the church and I see these things, I'm, I'm going to take it upon myself and I'm going to show them that I'm not, I might not be God, but I'm like God and I'm going I'm to remove their power to do that. You've never, it's never happened. It's never happened. It's never happened. The best way for someone who does not appropriate and steward the monies that God brings into the kingdom of God is to allow God to judge that one. Yeah. 
or those two or those three or whomever they are. We do not put, like Adam and Eve did, our confidence and our trust in the fruit on the tree. Had they put their trust and their confidence in the God who made the tree and then said, stay away from it because it will mislead you. It will rob from you. It will destroy you. What today you do in joy, tomorrow if you eat that fruit, you will do in sorrow. If we will allow the Father to do what the Father does and to judge, pass judgment where judgment is due, He will take care of the rest. But so many in the church world today, and I'm going to be talking about these things for a short time this morning as a, as a basis for what we'll get into next week. Today is going to be the root of what I want to speak to next Sunday. But it's important to me that you are here. And I know that there are people under the sound of my voice. I hope there's not people that are already tuning me out because you're saying, oh, he's just another preacher talking about money. You're going to miss an opportunity to walk in the fullness of what God wants you to walk in if you tune me out this morning. If you immediately in your heart begin to throw up walls and begin to push me aside and say, man, I can't wait till this is over so that I can leave this place. If you're the one, if you are one that is doing that right now, then I'm asking today that you repent right now and let God show you what God wants to show you. For those of you that are doing it right, I ask even you, do not put up walls that says I've learned everything I can learn. Tear down every wall today. Let the wall of the one who fears and the wall of the one who boasts be torn down today so that he can show us the fullness of what he wants us to see this morning. God's laws, I want you to say this with me. Say, God's laws are not to hinder me, but to make a way for me. That's a more powerful statement than the emphasis that you put upon it. Stand with me if you would, please. Put your hands on yourself and say this. Say, God's laws are not to hinder me. His laws make a way for me. They make a way for me, Tim. They make a way for me, Kaylee. They make a way for me, Isaac. His word makes a way for you, and it makes a way for me. You may be seated. I want to make this statement today regarding the state of the church. The state of the church. The kingdom of God and His church should be the standard of excellence, rising above every business, organization, and government. For the most part, with a few exceptions... The church is poor, it is needy, and it is in disrepair. The church, for the most part today around the world, is marked by lack and is seen as no different than the beggar on the street, deserving no respect or honor. I am certain that God is appalled by the condition of His church that we are in today. It is in this condition because of a lack of vision, a lack of willingness to teach, a lack of discipline, and a lack of faith. I'm going to read it again. The church is in the current condition that it's in because of a lack of vision within the church, a lack of teaching within the church, a lack of discipline within the church, and a lack of faith within the church. Before I say any more, I'm going to ask this question, not asking for an answer to this question. It's rhetorical. Answer it within yourself. But let's talk about faith and vision in the church today. Let me bring it home for each person under the sound of my voice. Don't answer. But how many people, last night before you went to bed, there was an anxiety in you before you went to bed, anxious for what you might hear this morning. You went to bed thinking to yourself, I cannot wait to get up in the morning and get to the house of God to hear what it is that the Father wants to bring to me. How many of you went to bed saying to your husband, to your wife, to your children, tomorrow morning is the most important time that we are going to have in this entire week. Nothing else we will do this week will be more important than the time we give to tomorrow morning when we gather together with believers. And then how many among us, how many maybe under my voice this morning, when they went to bed last night said to their husbands and their wives, do we really have to go? 
Is it really important? It's the 4th of July week. Can't we begin? Can't we clean the deck? Clean the pool? Paint the house? Sweep the driveway? Prepare the yard? We have guests that are coming in. Can't we do that instead? Is it really that important? We go to church every other Sunday. Is it really important that we go today? I want to tell you this this morning. Most of the people that are believing that, most of the people that would have said that, most of the people that would have said to their children, we're not going to church tomorrow morning because we have more important things to do. Most of the people that would have said that, most of them would have said it in naivety. They would have said it because they have come to a place where they've become naive about the potential and the possibilities that can be found in the kingdom of God. They've lost their vision. There is a lack of vision. There is a lack of faith. There is a lack of drive and passion and purpose in the kingdom of God. Most have found themselves in the churches in the condition and the disrepair that it is in today for this reason. Because when most people gather on a Sunday morning, they gather not out of anxiousness, not out of anticipation, not out of hope, not out of dreams, not out of vision, not out of desire, but out of obligation. Most got up in the morning this morning and they took a shower and they washed their hair and they blow dried it and they curled it. They ironed their shirts and their clothes and they were deciding what to put on because they were comparing themselves. I want to look as good as I did last week or better than I did. Somebody complimented this and they, and all of, there's a thousand different reasons why they've come to church today. But the only reason that really matters why I came to church today is because I believe that the anointing of God is present. And I'm not willing to miss one moment of what God might want to do in my life. That marks vision. That marks faith. That marks possibilities. And we are not in a kingdom of God that lacks possibilities. We are not a part. Those who call upon the name of the Lord and who have received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, who honor God and it is their heart to honor Him, we are not a part of a kingdom that lacks purpose. We are not a part of a kingdom that lacks vision. And the vision in the kingdom of God is bigger than what we see around us today. The kingdom of God needs people who believe in it. The kingdom of God needs people who have faith equal to the purpose and passion. The kingdom of God needs people who have fire that is shut up within their bones and they cannot keep it back anymore. The kingdom of God is calling out for a people who will rise up and say, do not count me among those who come up short, but count me among those who walk in the abundance, who walk in faith, and who believe. I am certain. That today the Father is appalled by the condition of the church when he looks around and he sees how the church is, the shape of it, the lack of people knocking down the door to get in. People who would rather be on the sands of the beach than in an auditorium where the Father is releasing what he wants to say and do. I'm not knocking vacations. Take your vacations. But never let it be said of you That the preacher is surprised when you're here, not surprised when you're not here. Is anybody hearing me today? The condition of the church today is not a result of God's inability to pour out on sons and daughters. The condition of the church today is a result of sons and daughters who have lost faith and vision, who have lost their passion and the why they gather in the first place. It has been said that there is no lack of money in the world, but it's simply in the wrong hands. After the, and I don't know if you watched it or not, I watched all of it, but after the embarrassing presidential debate on Thursday night, i got to give you a statistic that is shocking. First, let me emphasize how embarrassing the presidential... I'm, listen, I'm a patriot. I love America. I love America. I'm thankful for what God has given us in this place. I'm thankful for our freedoms. I'm thankful for what we have the opportunity to do in this incredible country. I'm not taking anything away from that. What I am saying is when I look at the options that we had on Thursday night, 
And I witness what I witness. And I think these are the people that folks chose to lead us. Either of these two. I'm not taking away from the fact that both of those in their own way could be good men. I'm neither Republican nor Democrat. I'm a son of God. I'm a son of God. This may be in all the years. I'm going to be 59. I'm 59. I'm going to be. I'm going to be 60. Babe, some things don't need to be corrected. So my first. The first opportunity I had to vote was in 1980, and I'm glad to say that I was one who voted for Ronald Reagan. And I voted in every single election since 1980. This is probably going to be the first election that I do not vote in. I don't know that I can pull the lever for either of these idiots, either of these fellows. (laughs) Neither one of them represent what I stand for. Neither of them represent what I believe in. And I know I have people on both sides of the aisle. But my hope and my confidence is not in the man behind a podium that can't even speak or can't tell the truth. My hope and my confidence is in Almighty God. But after this embarrassing, shameful, I, was, I felt humiliated for both of these men. After that shocking Letdown of a presidential debate this, e- this past Thursday evening. Within 12 hours, those two men raised, within 12 hours, $32 million. That means a lot of people watched that debate and watched all that they saw, and this was their vision. I'm going to give millions to that. I hope nobody under the sound of my voice did that. If you did, shame on you. Because they have way less power than the kingdom of God. Let me just say this. If you check the box on your income taxes to give $3 to the presidential fund, would you repent of that? They don't need your money. They already get it. That's why you're doing a tax return. $32 million. Just track with me this morning. In 12 hours. Was put into their coffers. From people all around the United States. But we. This church. The Rock of Central Florida. Three months ago I made an announcement. We need to expand. The school, the preschool, is at full capacity. We have an 18-month waiting list, minimum, for both the preschool and the school. There are people literally waiting to put their children in our school and our preschool. We have no capacity for it. This auditorium is transformed every week in order to do that. On days when there's not holidays, this auditorium, this living room is full every single Sunday. Every Sunday. Every week. There's no room for more to come in. So we're building. We're looking to build. And I made the announcement. We're going to build. We're going to prepare to build. A little over three months ago. And I said we're going to raise. The goal is to raise $700,000 to prepare us to build something. That will allow us to be able to do what we're called to do. The vision. Fulfill the vision and the passion and the purpose of this house. To grow the school the preschool, and to make more room for people to want to hear the truth on a Sunday morning. In 12 hours, they raised $32 million for two guys who couldn't put two sentences together. Slept halfway through it. In 12 months, I said, we can raise $700,000, we can do that. And we've only raised 55,000. What is wrong with this? I'm not fussing at anybody. I'm not doing that at all. Not in this house. If it sounds like that, don't take it that way. What I'm telling you is 
There's no lack of money. It's in the wrong hands. If there were proper... The church isn't strong because America is strong. Let's get this straight. Let's start here. The church isn't made strong because America is strong. America is made strong because the kingdom of God is strong. Now you need to hear what I'm telling you right now. America is not strong because... I mean, the church is not strong because the kingdom of God... Uh, the uh, government is strong. The government, America is strong because the church is strong. And this is backwards. There's dependence on the government every which way we go. And money flows into it. Organizations, corporations, individuals are looking... Just hear me out. I'm just telling you today, I'm going to get to Scripture in a minute. For those of you that are looking, waiting for that, it's coming. You're going to probably like that less than what I'm telling you now. But for individuals and organizations and all those, sowing $32 million in 12 hours into that that we saw in front of our face. Without even asking for it. And then the church... Needing to nearly plead for someone to have faith and vision and rise up so they can do and we can do what God's calling us to do is a travesty. This isn't on you, by the way. I said that a moment ago. I want you to know. When I met recently with one of the bankers in the process of going through this process, And he was sharing with me statistics. And he said, most churches, and he was was getting ready to ask me a question. He said, but in most churches, the number of people that tithe represents about 2% of their congregation. He said, do you know what percent of your congregation tithes? I said, I do. It's 92% of those who attend tithe. But then I said this, just hear me out. I said, but 100% of those who have vision and faith do. About 8% of our people lack vision and faith. I said, but 92% of the people who regularly attend this ministry are tithers and they're faithful. He was shocked because that is so outside the ordinary. But that's been true as long as we've been a church, and I'll tell you why, because I'm not afraid. I don't beg for money. I give opportunity to bring your first and your best every single week, but I do not beg. And today is not begging, today is teaching for those who have yet to learn. And for those who think we know all the reasons why, it's important that we actually do. In 2015, Warren Buffett, who I enjoy reading. I enjoy watching. I've read a number of his books. I enjoy him because I love the idea of financial responsibility. That's my heart. I have a degree in finance. That is my heart. So when I think of and consider Warren Buffett and what he does and what he's done, and this man, I don't know how old he is. I think he's in his 80s, 90s, and it may be now. But at one time was the, most wealth, the wealthiest person in the world. Today, I think he still ranks in the top three. Multi, 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 multi billionaire. I think somewhere around the realm of $80 billion. It would literally cost him thousands of dollars. If he stopped on the road to pick up a dollar, he loses money. That will give you an idea how much that is. If he sees a dollar bill laying on the road and stopped to pick it up, it would have cost him money just for his time. It's better to walk by it and say, can't waste money picking up a dollar. Now, how many of us know that feeling? But in 2015, he made a statement I think is profound. I want to share it. He was asked a question. He was in an interview, and I don't know who interviewed him. I don't remember all the details of it, but I remember the statement. But he was asked in the interview, he was asked, what do you think about taxing the rich? America taxing the rich more. We need to tax the rich. The rich get away with so much. You know, all these incentives and all these things that they do. Do we need to tax the rich more? 
And Warren Buffett thought for just a second, and then he looked at them and he responded, and he said, now keep in mind, he's a very wealthy man. At the time, he was the most wealthy in the world. And he responded in this way. He said, the poor are not poorer because the rich get richer. In other words, keep taking it from the rich. You are not helping the poor. With few exceptions, there are a few exceptions, but most people in a position where they've achieved wealth did that through very hard work. There are exceptions, but most did it because they worked hard. They were faithful over the little things, therefore they became faithful over the greater things. Then he went on to advocate back in 2015, the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit. He was one of the original advocates for this tax credit that decided this. What that did was it rewarded, it subsidized, it helped, it supplemented the income of those who were willing to work. Based on what they earned, they would be supplemented to help them get to a place where they could afford, quote unquote, the cost of living expenses, the EITC. He was part of the original purpose. He said, let's stop rewarding those who keep having babies to get more money and reward those who keep working so that they can get more money. And when I say stop rewarding those who keep having babies, that is across every line. That is white, black, Hispanic, Asian, whatever you might be. That comes across every line. I've met people in every race that what they think about is I'm going to keep having babies because I get more money for each baby that I have. And then I have people that will say, I'm not working because if I don't work, I lose money from the government. Can I tell you today? Will you listen to me today? Whether you are white, black, Hispanic, pink, red, orange, whatever color you might be today, wherever you fall on the line, never allow yourself to become a prisoner to a system. Never let yourself believe for even one second because of the color of your skin that somehow you you don't have the same possibilities that others do. No matter what color you are, no matter what color I am today, God put in place a way, a practice, a purpose, and principles that will provide for every man and for every woman, for every husband, for every wife, and for every home. And those principles are vision, faith, and discipline. Where there is vision, where there is faith, and where there is discipline, this one can do as well as this one. But where vision and faith lacks, we immediately remove ourselves from the hand of God being able to work in our, on our behalf. And then we find ourselves entirely trusting the government. I hope somebody's listening to what I'm telling you today. Somebody said, what does this have to do with tithing? We're getting there. This has everything to do with tithing. Because when I lose faith, and when I lose vision in what God can do in me, when I stop disciplining, When I stop being a good steward over what he's given me, and I'm depending on other people, provide for what I'm producing. And I'm not talking about just kids. I'm talking about needs. I'm talking about bills. I'm talking about debt. And we say to the government, provide for my needs. Provide for what I'm missing. When we begin to say to them, because we've lacked faith and vision, we've gotten ourselves into debt. We've gotten ourselves into these holes. We immediately take out of the hands of God his ability to be able to begin to work on our behalf. Do you think for a second that the enemy is not wise? Do you think for a second that we have a very different enemy than Adam and Eve faced? The same serpent clinging to a branch of a tree that got in the face of Adam and Eve and said, eat the fruit and everything you don't know, you will know. You will be like God's. Eat the fruit. All your answers will be provided for in the tree that's growing out of dirt. And today, the serpent has gotten in too many ears. The enemy, the devil, has gotten in too many ears of sons and daughters of God. And he said, stop trusting in the heavenly and trust in a tree that grows out of the dirt. And the tree that's growing out of the dirt is the government that we serve. I'm not anti-government. Like I said in the beginning, when I pray... 
I need you to interpret what I'm saying today. But my trust and my hope is not in my government. My trust, my blessing, my prosperity is found in the Father. My lack, my pain, and my suffering is found in the earthly. If I want to produce more pain and suffering and more lack, then I continue to not trust the Father. But if I want to arise above the conditions I find myself in, there has to be a genesis, a point in time where I begin to trust again. Where I say, Father, I repent. I've been eating the fruit and it tasted so good, but it's provided only limited resource. I repent. For laying hold of those things that you did not account to me. Today I repent and I lay hold of those things that you have. And restore my faith and restore my vision today. So that I can walk with you. You were not born to be a sign and a wonder of another statistic in the earth. That says if you are of this race or you are of this race or you are of this race. Then you fall into this category. Can I tell you you were not born. To be positioned within a race. You are not born to be separated because of your color. You are not born to be separated because of what your resources are. You were born no matter what color, what race, what ethnicity. You were born to demonstrate that God is still God. And He is the ruler of everything. The affluent without vision or faith is no different than the poor without vision or faith. When people lack vision and faith, the kingdom of God suffers. The greatest investment any of us will ever make is in the kingdom of God. I need you to say that with me. Say the greatest investment any of us will ever make is in the kingdom of God. I've known people in very, very, very spread out way, places in life. I've known people who had very little, but were faithful in everything they had. I've known people who have had very much, and they were happy to talk about what they had gained, but forgot to give glory and honor to God. I sat with a man not too long ago. That has, over the last season, come into significant wealth, at least apparently. I haven't actually seen it, but I've apparently. And he was sharing with me the wealth that he had come into and what he had gained. And was sharing with me regarding vehicles and things that he has been purchasing and what have you. And as I listened to him, while sitting there talking to him, I said, I want to look at your tithe record. And I did. And I said, the last time I saw any evidence of any blessing in your life at all was in December of last year. I said, I want to caution you. And all the things that you're getting. And all the things that you are doing. Remember from where it came. I said, and I said to him, I said, I know to you this is going to sound like a preacher that's saying, bring money. And you'd be right. Because I'm telling you, if you are rich toward cars, rich toward boats, rich toward land, rich toward houses, rich toward all of these things, because you've been given so much, but you are poor towards the kingdom. I said, I promise you this, sir, in a very short season, everything you're bragging about today, you will no longer possess. Because God will get what belongs to Him. So the greatest investment I will ever make is into the kingdom of God. How? Do I invest in the kingdom of God? He made it very simple. 
the tithe and the offerings. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12 says this. It says, Will man rob God, yet you are robbing me? But you say, How have we robbed you? And he said, In your tithes and your contributions, you are cursed with a curse because you're robbing me. The whole nation of you is robbing me. Bring the full tithe into the store. Everybody say full tithe. Full tithe. Not a token. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and therefore thereby put me to test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. He said, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruit of your soil. And your vine in the field will not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then, everybody say then. then. At that point, all nations will call you blessed. For you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. And yet, how does the world see the church today? I'm going to talk about it in just a second. Our attitude toward tithing reflects our attitude toward God. And he does not ask us to pay him for his love. He's not saying, pay me and I'll love you back. However, he does require us to sow into his purpose. Because the whole earth is his. And it needs to be taken care of. The purpose of an ever-increasing kingdom of believers sons and daughters there are people unreached today Daryl there are people unreached today there are a lot of people around the world that are reached but there are people unreached today around the world today because the finances simply aren't there the resources simply aren't there aren't present to be able to see to the needs of those people resources are around us again there's no lack of money there's no lack of resources in the wrong hands and the father says we need to get that right our faith in him is reflected in the seed that we sow into his kingdom I've never preached in a church that complained about having too much for years for years um, number of years almost four years I traveled this is a long time ago this was 35 Five, 37 years ago I started but for three and a half almost four years I traveled exclusively and preached in different places and evangelizing and taught in a lot of different a lot over a hundred churches and I never preached in a church that complained about too much but I preached in a lot of churches that talked about too little I preached in many that were afraid to receive an offering I remember one time one church in particularly Back then, when I was evangelizing, 30, started 37 years ago, back then, there weren't a lot of non-denominational churches. Most of them were denominational, one or the other. I preached in many different denominations. But I remember going to this one particular church. It was a denominational church, but I remember going to this church. It had maybe 250, 300 people in it, in the church. I'd been there numerous times. And each time that I would go to this church, and, and remember, it would cost me money. I'm paying for the gas to get there. I'm paying for the hotel to stay there. It wasn't often that churches would cover those costs. So I would have to pay for that. And what one church would believe is that what we can't cover, the next church will. You're going to the church, you know, 20 miles from here tomorrow or next week. So they'll cover whatever we can't cover. And I'd been to this church a number of times. And each time that I would leave that church, they would give me an offering. And I was always thankful for the offering, but they would, ne- they would give me an, what's considered an honorarium, which means they didn't give people an opportunity to sow into the ministry. They had already decided what they were going to pay, and it was $200. Now, you might say 37 years ago, $200 was a lot of money. I can tell you 37 years ago, $200 wouldn't cover three nights in a hotel, even then, and food, and the gas it took to get there. I wasn't married yet when I started. And I'd gone back to this church, and I was there, and I was in about the third night of the meeting, and I said to the pastor, 
I said, can I talk to you before service begins tonight? Again, I had been at this church numerous times, and each time they'd give me 200 bucks. And I've told you other stories before too. But I said, can we talk before service tonight? And he said, sure. So we go into his office, and I said to him, I said, uh, almost said his name, I don't want to say. You wouldn't know him anyway. But I said, Pastor, I said, um, can I ask you something? Would you receive an offering tonight? I've come here, I've driven here, it costs me money every time I come here, and I'm thankful that you have me, I went there about every six or seven months, and I'm thankful that you have me come here. But every time I come here, I leave, and I, I'm, I'm trying to buy food, I'm trying to eat. And I know you're thinking the next church is going to cover the lack, but I get to the next church and it's even more lack, and the lack keeps increasing. He said, you know what, Steve? He said, I can't do that. He said, I'm telling you because the people will not give. I've never received an offering like that in this church. And I can tell you right now, I know these people and they will not sow. They will not give. I said, let's, let's have faith. I said, I'll take that risk. I said, if you'll give the people an opportunity to demonstrate faith, don't beg them, don't plead. Just say, tonight we're going to do it different. I'm going to receive an offering and I'm going to set the basket up in front of the church. I said, if you'll do that tonight, Let's have faith. Let's just believe God. He said, I will. But he said, I'm telling you, it's not going to be good. We go out there. I preached. After preaching was over, he set the basket out. And he said, he went and explained the whole thing. He said, ladies and gentlemen, he said, I met with the evangelist before service tonight. And he asked me to do this. And um, he said, it was very apologetic. And I'm, I'm over there like, <laughs> and this is the condition of the church. But we're going to receive an offering for him tonight, and this is what he's going to get. Normally, we would give him an honorarium, but tonight we're going to receive an offering, so it's up to you. And they started coming. And they filled that offering bucket up, and I don't remember what it was right now, but it way covered not only the expenses of that church, but every other church that I was going to have to go to and minister to and hope that I could pay for the gas in the hotel to preach the gospel. In fact, it was a church right down from there that I, just to give you an idea of these days. Now I'm married. At this point, I'm married. But Kim and I had gone to this particular church, one particular church. It was a denominational church. And we'd get, we had gotten there. And I'd preached there before as well, once or twice, not much. And I got there and they said, we're excited because we're going to put you in a home that's in the National Historic District. I said to my wife, that means it stinks. Man, it's not good. My three worst words, National Historic District. <laughs> Just hear me out, if you would. And we get there. Kaylee was a little bitty baby. I mean little. I only, she was just learning to eat solid food, so however old she was, we were just starting to feed her. Six months-ish. Kaylee, my daughter that was up here. We get into this house. We drive up, and it was everything I expected it to be and worse. <laughs> this was in the wintertime in Tennessee. We go up to the front door of the house. They meet us there. They open the door. They're so excited. This home is Beautiful. We walk into that house, there are spider webs in every single corner. There is no electricity, no heat. And they think this is the coolest thing since sliced bread. And we get inside and they leave us and we go to the room that we're supposed to stay in and my wife pulls back the... Bed spread because when we walked to use the restroom, the toilet was pitch black with crud all around it. It was a white toilet underneath of all of that, and it was just crud. And she said, babe, we can't stay here. I said, we can't afford to stay anywhere else. We have no money. We can't stay anywhere else. Not only that, we'll offend them. Which today, I would offend them. But back then, I was more concerned about that than I am today. 
Not that I'm quick to offend, but I don't mind it if it requires it. And she, wrote, she pulled back that bedspread, and there was bubble gum stuck on the silk sheets. Hair that you could have stuffed a pillow with all over those sheets. She said, babe, I can't do it. I said, babe, the only thing I can say is we're going to have to pull these sheets off, shake them, and trust God. <laughs> this is the condition of the church. So then it's cold. Night, sun setting, we don't have electricity, it's cold. We start lighting candles in the house. Never got electricity, we were there three days. It's cold. That fortunately, they had a fireplace, but no wood. So I called the pastor and I said, sir, we don't have any, you know, and everything's a phone. I called the pastor. I said, we don't have any firewood. The baby's cold. We're cold. Couldn't take a bath in the bathtub because it was filled with spiders and webs. I mean, I don't even know who, there was an iguana. There were all kinds of animals and fish tanks all over that house. It smelled like the Sanford Zoo. And I called him and he said, oh, I don't have any firewood. I, I, you'll have to find some, maybe a gas station down the road. I thought, and you preach the gospel without conviction? And I went and I found some firewood and we burned firewood and we sat by that fire. We slept by that fire. We ended up putting a pallet out and sleeping on the floor by that fire just to stay warm with our little six-month-old baby. For the glory of God. Now it gets better. We stayed there for a full week at the end of the week. Yeah, actually four days. It was four nights that we stayed at that church because we left on Thursday. We, or we got there on Sunday. We left on Thursday, whatever that is. At the end of that time that we were there, he comes up to me and he said, unfortunately, the church couldn't afford an offering, but we did get you this. And they gave Kim and me both a t-shirt that said on it, Jesus Christ, the real thing. This is a true story. And I said to myself, self, these people do not understand the kingdom of God. But I could go down a long, maybe I'll do it sometime. A long list of the experiences in, in almost four years that I had in these places. When we started the Rock of Central Florida, we were sent here by Apostle F. Nolan Ball. And when we came here, I'm so thankful that he taught me a different way. Yes. And when we came here, we never have a guest that we do not bless them above and beyond. And I give you opportunity every time to sow into them with your offering. And you bless them every single time. Every single time. We send them away, and they're happy they came every single time. We don't put them in a roach motel. We put them in the Marriott. Somebody might say, well, that's, that's indulgence. No, it's not. I don't want somebody else to have to pay the same cost that Kim and I had to pay. I've preached in so many churches in those years and even since, that were filled with people wearing fancy clothes, driving high-end cars, living in opulent houses. But the church was dilapidated and smelled like old shoes because it couldn't afford to paint its walls or clean its carpets. Does this honor God? If I could read all of Malachi... Chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, there's one particular verse in Malachi that rebukes the preachers. And he said, preachers, because you have refrained from teaching the people about their tithe and the offering and giving them an opportunity to trust God, to have faith and to have vision, because of that, I'm going to th throw you in a pot and cast in fish hooks, and I'm going to pull the fish hook out, and whatever flesh of you that comes off with it will give it to the people. He said, and I will smear scripture in Malachi. He said, I will smear dung in your face. If you start robbing the people because you don't tell them the truth. Can I tell you today, the kingdom of God 
requires faith and vision. And tithing is an act of faith. Tithing is required of all of us, not so that we have less, which is the argument so many people hear, I can't afford to tithe, I can't afford to give, I can't afford to be a part of this. It's not so that we have less, but so that God can do more with us and God can do more around us. So in a moment, I'm going to read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5 about the grace of God. But before I do that, I want you to understand this today. This message this morning is the foundation for why we bring our first and our best. And what is the condition of, that the church has gotten itself in because we have not, preachers have not been willing, teachers have not been willing to stand up and teach people about tithe and offering. I've been teaching about it in this house for almost 25 years. I've never withheld or restrained myself from teaching about the tithe and the offering, and yet, I said it to my wife this morning on the way here. I said it is still probably one of the most difficult things to teach, not because I'm afraid to teach it, because I'm always concerned about how people will interpret it. And yet I can't allow people's interpretation to determine whether or not I am obligated to tell them the truth. And if I am to, the, to be one to stand behind the pulpit, I then am to be one that will stand up and that will honor God with faith and vision because if I lack faith and vision, the people that trust me will lack faith and vision. I can tell you today, the kingdom of God is suffering because too many inside the church lack faith and vision. They have a lot of confidence in their cars and in their houses and in their things and all the stuff they've attained, but have little confidence in what God can do if we will trust Him with our first and our best and God is asking of you and me if you're watching us online today and you'll say you know what I don't and I'm going to tell you this today I'm going to be as honest as I can possibly be there are a thousand people watching us online right now wherever you are you're all over the literally watching us all over the world right now and out of all the people that are watching us online today out of all of them maybe 10 to 15 have ever been a part of tithe and offering in this ministry I want to say to you today if you are a part of this ministry then that responsibility also lies on you we are not performers we are teachers and we are evangelists and prophets and apostles we are those called of God to raise up a people who have faith and vision. We're not dancing because you like the dance. We're not singing because you like the song. We're not doing what we do because you like what we do. We're doing what we do because God is calling out to raise up a people who will recognize that He is God and there is not another. He's bigger than our government. He's bigger than our nation. He's bigger than our needs. He's bigger than our pains. He's bigger than our lack. He's bigger than where we are. He is God and He has a way for you and me. Amen. Thank you. Jenny, I thought you were coming. I'm, I got in. I, mean, I was all into it. I feel like I need three more. There we go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. My watch. <laughs> SOS emergency call. I'm okay. I did not fall. Okay. Again, I can't help what people will think. What I can tell you is this. The tithe is not an option. The tithe is not an option. A tithe is a tenth. It's also in the New Testament. People will say, oh, that's Old Testament law. Well, it starts as law, but it, it ends in spirit. It's been a long time since I've only given 10%. A long time. I've told you the story. I'll share it next week. When we go on, because I'm going to talk about how it transcends from law to spirit, how we honor God with the tithe, how in our right relationship with the Father, it's our joy to bring Him our first and our best. There was a season in my life, in mine and Kim's life, there was a long time that I didn't tithe because I didn't know, and I appreciate, and they're here today, and I'm not going to call them out, but I appreciate the person. I'm going to say this, and I think I'm the only one that knows you came to me and said that. You're here this morning, but you came to me last week, and I'm so thankful that you did. And you said, you know what? I've never been in a church where they talked about tithe. So I'm excited to learn. I hope you've learned today. But that right there, that statement you made last week is indicative. It is indicative of the condition of the church today. The reason all around the world the church is looked down upon is because the church has not become the standard 
that God intends it to be. The church should be the standard, not the joke. I hope you're hearing me today. The tithe. The Father says, I'm going to give to you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to provide for you. But I require of you a tithe. The offering is above and beyond the tithe. You do that by word and by spirit. That's why you've heard me say over and over and over and over, those who have been a part of this house, I'm never going to beg for money. I am going to require the tithe. I'm going to say, bring your tithe. But the offering that is above and beyond the tithe, whether it's the building fund, mission, whatever it might be, love offerings that we receive, that's by word. Father, what is your word to me regarding this? And you bring that. But the tithe, that's in stone. Father says, I'm requiring this of you. And preachers, if you do not require this of them, I'm going to require something of you that's far greater. I hope that in my teaching this morning, for those that are watching online, I want you to know, or in this building, first of all, I want you to know, every single person under the sound of my voice, you matter to me. This, I hope this word does not come to you as a word that feels like it's demanding something. But I hope instead it's coming to you today as a word that is teaching you something. Becomes revelation. Helps you understand why we receive the tithe and the offering. And judgment isn't in your hand. For those that use it incorrectly, judgment is in the hands of God. You be faithful over what He asks of you, what He's requiring of you or me. He'll take care of the rest. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1-5 through 5 says this. says, we want to know you. This is just such a powerful, and I love this passage because it's so empowering for those who say, but I don't have anything. I'm, I'm not in a position. I don't have anything. And he speaks to that. This is the grace of God. He says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been, been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. What a profound statement. Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed. It's almost contradictory. But have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they have, according to their means, as I can testify, saw it with my own eyes, Paul said. And even beyond their means, of their own accord, they begged us earnestly for the favor of taking part. They said, we want to sow. Paul, don't leave here without giving us an opportunity to bring our first and our best. We want to sow. They begged us for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. And then by the will of God to us. In other words, they trusted God. And then they trusted the men that God sent to be stewards over what they would bring. Even in their extreme poverty, they overflowed. Now, do not misinterpret that. I'm not telling people in here, you give everything that you've got because I am not the one that believes in telling people, begging people, pleading with people, Empty your bank account and give it all to God. I'm not that. What I am saying is the tithe is the Lord's. Everybody say this with me. Say the tithe is the Lord's. It's not mine. He asks, requires what is His. The offering is yours. And you give out of faith, but the tithe is the Lord's. The tithe is not seed. The tithe is the land that He owns. Father, I bring to You my very first in my abundance or in my lack. 
I bring to you my very first and I bring to you my very best and I trust you with it. Stand with me if you would please this morning. I say to you today, trust Yahweh, trust God. Why? Because he has never compromised his word. He has never compromised his word. When I think back on those folks, all those folks, and I wonder how many of those folks who were part of that $32 million going to those presidential hopefuls, how many of those folks that threw $32 million at two people that might not even be there at the end of four years? They threw $32 million. I wonder how many of those people are in church this morning and never opened their checkbook. Because their faith is in the tree, not in the creator of the tree. Their faith is in the fruit on the tree, not in the one who put the fruit on the tree.